and there was a ping and some shattered glass. And Bart said, I think I've been shot. And my aunt said, don't be ridiculous. And the bullet was already flying and bouncing off like the cabinets. And it went right past one of my cousin's heads and then hit the mantle and fell. And he probably had already bled out. Just minutes after 52-year-old Dr. Barnett Slepian and his wife returned home from synagogue, a sniper shot one bullet from a high-powered rifle into their home, killing the doctor. The fifth such shooting over the past four years, but the first to result in death. This latest victim in America. My Uncle Bart was an obstetrician gynecologist. He became an OBGYN because he thought it was a happy specialty, like he delivered babies or patients weren't sick. He um, started doing abortions, trained in abortions, because at the time he was in medical school, it wasn't really politicized. It was, it was just something you learned, like you learned DNCs and you learned pap smears and you learned everything else. Before that, the anti-abortion movement in this country anyway had mostly been um, a Catholic phenomenon and um, a very intellectually consistent Catholic phenomenon. They were pro-life in every sense of the word. They were against the death penalty, they were against euthanasia, they were anti-war, they were anti-nuke, and they were pro-life or, or anti-abortion. But they were a very quiet, sort of peaceful movement. And in the later 80s, um, the evangelical movement, which it's called the Fourth Awakening in the United States. It became very, very big here. Really circled the wagons around abortion to motivate people and ending abortion and began comparing it to a genocide and began comparing it to the Holocaust. And it became sort of a pastime for whole church groups, like busloads of church ladies would go to clinics and they would pray or they, as a got more radicalized in the later 80s, um, they would do what they call rescue, which is they would kneel or crawl across the parking lot like a baby to the front of a clinic. And then when the police came, they would go limp, like they would be non-compliant. And then when the police took them in, they would only identify themselves as baby doe. I mean, the police were completely befuddled by this. I mean, these were like church ladies. And so they usually just let them go after an hour or two. Because there was so little cost, it really became like, I mean, like this pastime, like you felt like you went and you did your good deed over the weekend, and, and I'm sure there was a lot of camaraderie and an adrenaline rush to the whole thing, and you tried to save babies. Out of that, in that group, they felt they weren't being effective in stopping abortion, even with the rescues, and um, it became more and more violent. My uncle was a very combative person. Didn't like bullies, didn't like being bullied, didn't back away from a fight, um, didn't think anybody had the right to tell him how he should do his practice. He felt that the doctors that quit made him more of a target because by the time he was killed, he was one of only four doctors in his entire region, but meaning he and his three other colleagues were responsible for the, you know, abortion needs of about a quarter of a million women. One of the biggest, I think, misconceptions about the doctors of his era, and I've interviewed a lot of them, is that they were like super liberal and really into women's rights and freedom of choice. They tended to be more libertarian, like you stay out of my stuff, I'll stay out of your stuff. It wasn't a cause in the way people think it was a cause for them. Bart was killed on October 23rd, 1998. My Uncle Bart and my Aunt Lynn went to synagogue services to commemorate the death of my grandfather. It's called a yard site in um, Hebrew. They came home. 
Bart put down his keys like on a little table and then he went and he to the refrigerator and got out some soup and he put it in the microwave. Authorities say the sniper was hiding in the family's backyard just waiting for the couple to return home. The killing comes just days after authorities warned abortion providers. My aunt was a nurse and um, she started CPR right away. One of my cousins called 911. One was trying to like stop the bleeding with like paper towels. His heart had completely collapsed. There was no blood in his body. I don't know, for whatever reason, my way of coping with this was to try to understand the guy who did it, like why. Jim, that's the guy who killed him, Jim Cop, went on the lamb, he ran off. And so I couldn't talk to him right away. And so I got to know, like I called all of Jim's friends, like I, I could figure out like there'd be newspaper articles about him and there would be Somebody quoted, oh, you know, he stayed with me, and I'd be like, hi, <laughs> I'm Bart Slepian's niece. Like, will you talk to me about Jim? And like, they were all super nice. I mean, like, they were the night. And I would fly, like, to Pittsburgh, or some people would drive up here to meet me. And, and I think a lot of them had conversion fantasies that I was going to convert to their cause. Jim was apprehended in France about two and a half years after he had gone on the lam. And I happened to have, be calling his friend Susan that day. And I felt like the FBI had told our family, it wasn't in the news yet, but I felt like I had to tell Susan before we talked. So I said, you know, Jim was caught today in France. And she said, oh, good, I'll go see him. And so I said, well, can I come? And she said, whatever Jesus wants. And so I was like, okay. I'd never been in a prison before, and so I thought it'd be like on Law and & Order, and there'd be like a plexiglass thing, and you'd talk on the phone. But no, French jail is incredibly civilized. Like, you can bring fresh laundry for your prisoner, you can, you know, it's very nice. And they give you a nice little room, private, just you and your prisoner, and a little table, and then they'd lock you in it with them. He was smaller than I imagined. Like I had, you know, I had made him a monster in my head. And so he was this kind of slight man with really bright blue eyes, like Santa Claus eyes, which kind of freaked me out. He gave me a lot of movie recommendations. Um, he flirted, which totally blew my mind. He said he was innocent, but that somebody from his religion had done it and so that was like the same as his, him doing it. I brought greetings from some of his friends. I mean, I really was not a journalist at this time. And so some people had asked me to say hello and like he would curl into fetal position and cry. And I'd recently had a baby. So like I had this intense like maternal instinct to like cradle. I mean, it was, to say it was bizarre is I can't even describe how strange it was. I don't have any vengeance in me. Like, you know, we've been looking for people who helped. And it's not like I want them to go to jail or be punished or it's like, I just want to understand it. And like a long time ago, I figured out crazy is crazy. You know, crazy person gets a gun. That's the beginning and the end of the story in a lot of ways. In Canada, three doctors have been wounded by snipers. All three cases are unsolved. Everyone's getting older. We're never going to know how this went down. And it's important to understand, like, nobody acts alone, you know, and you can't be a terrorist alone, really. And, you know, even if you are pulling the trigger by yourself, and even if you're radicalized online, there is a community around you that has supported you and encouraged you and helped you down this very destructive, awful path. And it was important to understand that and how it happened here. 
And I thought, if there's one person who can do this right, it's David Ridgen. I mean, I thought, like, there's, that's it. 